Or, you know, can I give you a quick application on this one? When you eat dinner, and I hope you eat dinner together. <laughs> if you aren't, you will when we get done. It is a God-given, ordained thing that families turn off the tube and eat dinner together so you have focused attention so you actually listen to one another. And what they say matters. Focused attention means your body language and your ears and you follow up with questions like what they said actually meant something to you. You got it? It will communicate powerfully that you love them and builds a relationship. Right on top of that is eye contact. And when you have the small ones, especially us dads, sometimes we forget. You know, you have, remember when they're little and they come and they grab your knees and stuff? By the way, this isn't a side. This is free. What I learned early on, I was a pastor early on and a workaholic. And, you know, when the phone rang, I would jump up and I've got to go meet someone's need. And, you know, my wife just said, why don't you just lighten up a little bit? And, oh, they need me, they need me, they need me. Uh, you know, there's a little uh, work, behind workaholism is ego. It's arrogance. It's grandiosity. It's the lie that you think you're so important that everyone needs you. And then you tell everyone how busy you are as a stroke of your own importance. And, and you know how I knew when I was too busy? Is when, when you're walking and the kids are on, when you're like this, that means you're too busy. And what I learned is, especially when they're small, I need to get down on one knee, especially when I'm talking to them, and look at them eyeball. And that means when you're talking at the table and they talk, you turn your body and you look at them eyeball to eyeball. When you have unconditional love expressed, when you schedule time with them, when you give them focused attention like they really matter and look into their eyes, you know what you're doing? It's like putting money in the relational bank and it gains interest. Number five is what I call ongoing communication. And if I'm repeating myself on this one, it's on purpose. Let me give you three specific ways to develop communication with your kids. Number one, eat dinner together. Have, have we heard that one yet? <laughs> eat dinner together. And I understand, you know, there are some American families, some Christian American families, dinner together is in the minivan as you drive through Burger King or McDonald's on the way to the third practice this week. And if you're on the traveling teams, where are you on Sunday morning? Traveling, traveling right? So what are you teaching your kids? Oh, man, you're going to be a star. Basketball, soccer, softball, fast pitch, whatever it is. It's a lot more important than God. Oh, Chip, I would never think that. It doesn't matter what you think. It's what you're modeling, remember? Your kids are not going to do what you say. They're just going to do what you do. Ooh, I think we hit a few raw nerves on that one. I'll let you kind of ponder and prayerfully smoke that for a while. <laughs> Ongoing communication, dinner, give me a second one, bedtime, especially when your kids are young. But even now, I mean, with my kids nearly all grown, man, always kiss them goodnight. When they're small, you always read them a story. And men, if you, if you want to endear, I mean, you have a role, make up stories. You know, read a Bible story, make up stories. I made up the wildest stories. I made them up as I went. And then it would get too late, and I'd say, and now the exciting conclusion Tomorrow night. I had no idea what tomorrow night was going to be. <laughs> but we had such fun, and you tickle, and the pillows. Dinners, bedtimes, and the third one under ongoing communication, shared experiences. Plan in times, build memories. Go camping. It's hard. Go camping. <laughs> Go to Disney World. Go out for milkshakes. Play basketball in the driveway. Plan it in. Shared experiences. Ongoing communication. Uh, meaningful touching. Uh, hug your kids. Dads, again, when they're small, wrestle, 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 wrestle. It doesn't mean any of your kids are going to make it to the WWF or anything like that. <laughs> but have you ever wondered why your kids want to wrestle? They want to touch you. One of the most powerful vehicles of love in the world is the human hands and arms and touching and loving and holding. Uh, my daughter, when, when she was little, I, I, I tried to communicate to my wife that, you know, honey, it's just because I love our kids. And every time, you, you, ladies, you know when you're cooking, your husbands, you know, they always, they always want to hug and kiss, right? Yeah. 
Like, would you get out of here? Well, honey, you know, and I said, I'm doing this for the kids. I'm modeling for the kids. This, you, know, you know, and so finally she'd put her hands down, okay, and she'd hug me, and my little girl would run, and she'd say, I want to do a sandwich. I want to do a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And she would get in between us, and I would hug my wife, and she'd be in the middle. What do you think she's really saying? She's really saying is, man, I, I, I want to feel life and body all around me of people that I trust and I feel safe. Don't ever stop hugging. And, and I keep tapping to the men because I think in our culture what happens when your girls start to develop and they grow up, don't stop hugging them. Hug them appropriately. If your little girl doesn't get positive, appropriate male attention, she will go find male attention somewhere else. And yet, it's just a weird thing for a man, so I'm just going to shoot it straight. You know, you wake up one day, and she's a little girl, and you wake up, and she's a young woman, and you go, whoa. She's a little girl, and she's a young, young woman. Like, she's really pretty and attractive, like my wife, and she's developing everywhere. And as a man, you kind of feel like, I love you, honey. <laughs> And you know what your daughter is? You're just dad. You know what she needs? Man, she just needs you to hug them and love them and hold them and touch them at every age. You want relationships that build bonds. Uh, number seven is uh, have fun together. Have fun together. Boy, there's some parents. The, you know the parents that I really can, are concerned about too? The parents that don't seem to give a rip and are neglectful. But the other parents that I'm really concerned about are the ones that are so spiritual. Okay, Johnny, I know it's, we've only done four hours of Bible study tonight. Will you give me that verse right now? We're on our way to Awana. You have to have all 57 word perfect. Go, 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 go. You know what kids like that do? They go, my parent is a nut. And as soon as I can get out of here, I'm leaving. Everything is so spiritual and so rigid. Family devotions are very important. We're going to talk about them. And they should be brief. They should be focused. They should be fun. And you ought to have fun with your kids. And then finally, pray together. I just pray together. Have fun together. Pray together. Pray at the table. Pray at bedtime. Pray during crisis. When you hear one of those sirens go by, pray. Just, you know, and let your kids know, you know, someone's hurting somewhere. Go ahead and pray. I, I didn't even notice it. A few years ago, we got in the car and ready to go somewhere, and my daughter said, Dad, what, are we going to pray? Oh, yeah. I did, I did, we had formed over the years a habitual habit that, you know, you got in the car, where are we going to go? Pray for safety, pray for where we're going to go. I, I didn't even, it was just an unconscious thing, and I skipped it. She said, you know what? I said, thank you, honey, but Pray. One of the fun things in our family now, my family was six, and now we're down to three. And it um, seems like it's either Tuesday or Thursday night. I can't remember exactly how it works. But um, we eat dinner, and then we sort of debrief, and we have all the little, but it's a little bit more formal. And we go around and talk about what do you want us to pray for you? And then we pray for the rest of our family. And then we pray, and then we do the dishes, and then we go get ice cream. Let's model the joy and the power of Christ just in who we are and how we live. Final principle is that positive parenting requires constant repair and ongoing maintenance. Constant repair and ongoing maintenance. Anybody believe that here? Can I tell you that if you come up with the perfect plan, and I got so frustrated early, this child needs that, this child needs this, this one's a bit com compulsive. Okay, good. We're going to put a list of all their chores. When they do the chores, we put a star in the box. When we put a star in the box, they respond. They're doing their chores now. It works, it works, it works. Three months later, it doesn't work at all. This one's struggling in school. We come up with a plan. I'll do the math, you do the English. We help them, we help them, we help them. It works, and then it doesn't work at all. These two aren't getting along, so we have them memorize this verse, and when they scream and yell at each other, they have to put a quarter in a jar. <gasps> Great, it works, and then it doesn't work at all. We're doing real good. We're being really consistent. Then I sit in the old lazy boy, and they're screaming at each other, I'm too tired to discipline them now. <laughs> it's not working again. Positive parenting requires constant repair and ongoing maintenance. You never get it wired. You never get it perfect. Your kids are never going to have it all together. I can remember one or two times. <laughs> Ready? I can remember one or two times when all my kids were doing well at the same time. 
and I put three up on purpose. I'm just trying to let you know, it's not neat. It's not clean. You don't have it together. The devotions don't work out. It's not, you know, when someone gets up and talks about this stuff, it sounds so good and so organized. Life is messy. And that's why 1 John 1, 9 is in the Bible. Because he understands who's really sitting in this room. And he understands every single person that will ever watch this tape. And he understands there are people that struggle and they long to do better. And there's private things in, in their heart. And there's things in their past. And there's people in this room that have screamed at their kids. There's people in this room that know that they're neglectful. There's people in this room that are trying so hard and that are so frustrated. There's people in this room that are ready to give up. And God would say, hey, hang in there. I'm at work. Co-labor with me. Keep a clear focus on the target, right? Remember, you're the teacher. Model it. And if, even if you're not doing well, model that you go to God and ask him for forgiveness. It's amazing. Create a loving environment. And then when you blow it, 1 John 1, 9. What's the promise here? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. This is the principle of process. Don't forget this one. Don't walk out of here discouraged. Don't walk out of here thinking, I'm not modeling close to what Jesus wants me to. I'm a terrible parent. Okay, ask him to forgive you for that part and get back on the track. Okay? What kind of parent are you going to get if you leave just down to the dumps? There is hope, there is power, there is God's word, there is his spirit, there is a community of believers. Confess your sin. Get on it. He will cleanse and he will forgive. And by the way, there are five powerful words that you need to use regularly. The first two are, I'm sorry. And the last three are, please forgive me. It's never too late. I don't know where you are. I don't know where you've been. I don't know how discouraged. Uh, you may think you've really blown it. I'm telling you tonight, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope. God can take any mess that you have and he can turn it around. And I could give you lists and lists and lists of stories of other people. But more than that, I can tell you that you're looking at someone that never opened a Bible till he was 18 that married a woman that didn't open the Bible or come to Christ till she was 25. We both come from th families that had alcohol in our background, so they were dysfunctional. We happened to be a blended family because my wife came to the Lord after she was abandoned by her husband. So here we have two kids together with two adults, no Christian background, dysfunctional past. We've never opened the Bible, and we don't have a clue of what we're doing. And I got four kids that walk with God and love him with all their heart because it's never too late and you never have to give up. And I think God has me teaching this for a reason. I think he would say to you, if he can raise kids that love God out of a background like mine and a background like my wife's and bringing us together, there is hope for everyone.